A reading from St. John, the 17th chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Shakespeare famously wrote in Romeo and Juliet, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. The Montague and Capulet families were enemies and their family names were what prevented Romeo and Juliet from being together. Those names had power. Those names had meaning just as all names have power and meaning. Even the names that we give our pets can have power and even meaning. My dog, a beagle, is named Porthos. He's named after one of the three musketeers. He's also named after the beagle of Captain Archer on Star Trek Enterprise. 
Yes, I admit, I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. But when Porthos was a puppy, I trained him that sit automatically meant stay, and that he wouldn't move until he heard his name. And to this day, Porthos will not move until he hears his name. Because that name, even of a pet, has meaning. It has power. And today we take up the first petition of the Our Father, Hallowed be thy name. And we pray in this petition that God's name would be kept holy among us. For his name is holy in and of itself. But we pray that he would keep it holy among us. And he does this when he brings his holy word to us, and it is kept and taught in its truth and purity. And that we would deny ourselves our opinions, our emotions, our feeble understandings or misunderstandings of his word, that when we can't make head nor tails of it, how can bread and wine be body and blood? How can a little bit of water do such great things? We submit our reason to his word and believe what it says. We can understand the importance of the first petition when we understand what God's name is, and that it has power and meaning. For God's name is his nature, his character, his reputation. It's who he is. His name is holy in itself, meaning that he is who he is regardless of what anyone believes about him. As God said when he revealed his name to Moses at the burning bush, I am who I am. It's who he is. But God's name is kept holy among us when we know him for who he is and speak of him accordingly and act before him accordingly. And God defines himself as a deliverer. As a, as a redeemer who doesn't go back on his oath, who doesn't go back on his promises, but keeps them and fulfills them. And so we see God wraps up his people in his name. He stakes his reputation on them. When he defines himself as, I am the Lord, your God, he delivers, redeems, he keeps his oath, and he stakes his reputation on the people who bear his name. And he is gracious, he is merciful, he is long-suffering, he is loving, faithful, forgiving, and just. That's who God is. That's his nature, that's his character, that's his name. God says in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 9, but I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived, in whose sight I made myself known to them in bringing them out of the land of Egypt. God gave no opportunity for anyone to find fault with him. Because no one could say that God wasn't true to his nature or his word. For he acted according to his name. In spite of the fact that his people didn't deserve it. And this is a constant theme we can see all over the Old Testament. The Israelites inherited the promised land, but then forsook God and went after other gods. They would sacrifice their children, they would worship idols, and they would even set up altars and shrines to false gods in the temple. God is a just God. 
He doesn't clear the guilty. But he acts in justice according to his name. And yet, when the Israelites were later scattered among the nations, God's name was profaned wherever they went, so that God would say, the, so that the nations would say, these are the people of God, and are gone forth out of his land. God's name was not being kept holy among his people. And on account of them, God appeared to the world to be something that he's not. And so God acted. He says, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. And then he says, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. And so God was gracious. He was merciful to his people. Not because they deserved it, but because that's who he is. He forgave their iniquity and their transgression and their sin, not because they deserved it, but because it's God's nature and character to do so. He didn't act for their sake, but for the sake of his name. And when the Lord acts for the sake of his name, we find that he acts for the benefit of his people. Because he is who we need and whose name we bear. For it is true to this day that God acts for the sake of his name, and that is our hope. Because we haven't deserved anything different than the people of Israel. And so we don't want the Lord to act for our sake according to our works or merits because we've earned nothing except his anger and condemnation. And so when Jesus teaches his disciples and his church and us to pray, hallowed be thy name, let your name be sanctified and kept holy. When we pray this petition, we're asking that God would be seen among us for who he is. that he would act toward us according to his nature and not according to ours or to our merits or to our works. So out of all the petitions of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gives to us, this one is perhaps the most important because in answering this first petition, God accomplishes our salvation. For the Father sent his Son for the purpose of sanctifying his name. That is, for the purpose of being seen by the world for who he is. And so the Father gives his Son the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves. And Jesus takes action for the sake of the name. And you see God for who he is on the cross. And it is into the name of the triune God that you are baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. There is power, saving power, in God's name. Hallowed be thy name. Is first and foremost a prayer that the Father himself would sanctify his name. And the greatest answer to that prayer is the crucifixion of Jesus. 
For in his crucifixion, God is seen to be what he is. He is deliverer. He is redeemer. He is oath keeper. And he is wrapped up with you, his people. He is gracious and merciful. He is long-suffering. He is loving, faithful, forgiving, and just. Hallowed be thy name. The Father has hallowed his name in the holy blood of his Son. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.